turn to the book of John, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12, and we'll start reading from verse 12 to 21. According to St. John, chapter 12, commencing from verse 12 up to 21. Now you're probably wondering, we just finished Christmas and now you're talking about Easter. Well, it's always Easter first. So, uh, whatever the order, uh, I want you to know that God has a word for us. Amen. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna! <coughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's cart. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him because they heard that he had performed the sign. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that? You're not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from the Tzeda of Galilee and began to ask him, saying, <coughs> Sir, we wish to see Jesus. That's the title of my message this morning. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now folks, I want you to know that Jesus was a great attraction. Then, but not now. He was the attraction. When he came to Jerusalem, multitudes followed him with palm branches crying, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And uh, as we read verses 20 and 21, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast at this time. The same came therefore to Philip and desired him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. There are many people at the feast, thousands of people, just like the church every Sunday morning. Thousands come. But amongst this group of people that come to church are those who are spectators who just come to see, who just come to mock themselves. Well, some would call them hypocrites, others would call them skeptics, doubters, scoffers, but in the midst of this great company of people, there's a remnant that truly came to worship. Praise God for that. They didn't come to spectate, they didn't come to criticize. They didn't come to impress anybody with their new car, new suit, or new dress. They came to worship. Amen. Is there anybody here right now who's 
come to worship. Amen. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here who came just to glorify the Lord? Amen. Is there anybody here who's come to worship Him in spirit and in truth? Amen. The Bible tells us the Greeks came to worship. And they knew if they were going to really worship Him, they needed to meet Jesus. Now our worship is going to be very empty and void if we don't meet Jesus. And so these Greeks said, we wish to meet Jesus. We came to worship, but our worship is going to be incomplete without Jesus. We need to see Jesus. In recent days, the scripture has brought great conviction to my soul. And I believe it should to all of us here as well. Because to a large degree, we have failed to present to the world the Jesus of the Bible. We've presented a false Jesus, not the real Jesus. Why don't they follow him in multitudes today? We have preached organizations, denominations. We've preached religion and traditions, rules and regulations. We preach God's blessings plan, the eight steps to a breakthrough, financial breakthrough, the seven keys to a miracle, all of that. My concern today, dear friends, is that we preached all of this so well, but we failed to meet Jesus. Sunday after Sunday, people come to worship, but they fail to meet Jesus. You see, when you fail to meet Jesus, everything else will have no meaning. But when you meet Jesus, your life will never be the same again. Amen. Your life will have meaning. Somehow, Jesus has gotten covered up by all our dogmas and creeds. We've got so enamored with the privileges and blessings of being the children of God that we've forgotten and misplaced the Jesus of the Bible. There's today, as there was in the days of the Bible, cry from the human heart, Sir, we wish to meet Jesus. Madam, we wish to meet Jesus. I love the church. I believe in the doctrines and the teachings of the church. I believe in godly traditions and practices of the church. But we must never forget who is the head of the church. And the head of the church is a living person, Jesus Christ, Amen. the Son of God. It's not religion or traditions or doctrines that saves the lost. Thank God for that. But religion and traditions and doctrines can save nobody. Can heal nobody. Can set no captives free. It's the living Savior. The person Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is the Healer. He is the Deliverer. He is the Baptizer in the Holy Ghost and power. I believe it is a crime shame that so many in the body of Christ have lost sight of Jesus. Even worse, that it's even a fact today that people have never heard the voice of Jesus. And yet they come week after week to worship. Yet they are Christians for years. Even worse is that many have allowed other things to displace the vision and now they would rather have religion rather than Jesus. They would rather have traditions rather than Jesus. They would rather have blessings rather than Jesus. And so everybody is chasing after something. Let us get something. We want healing. So they chase after Jesus for healing, but not Jesus. So we're just chasing after something, but not Jesus himself. It's amazing 
How many people want prosperity, but they don't want Jesus? They want healing, but they don't want Jesus. They want power, but they don't want Jesus. They want joy and peace, but they don't want Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. So you can't have peace without Jesus. No matter what your thirst is, Jesus is the author and the finisher of it all. I believe we will see great revival in the body of Christ. When the heart cry of the church is, we want to see Jesus. Amen. We want to see Jesus. Amen. When the church can no longer be satisfied and pacified with anything else, we should not be satisfied with all these new things coming in, with some great speaker, with some great singer. That should not satisfy us. It should be Jesus. Amen. The manifest presence of Jesus. Then only I believe we will have a great and a mighty revival. Around the world today, churches are shutting down and locking their doors. Organizations are dying. People are leaving the churches and going off into new age and occult practices. Why? Why would people be looking for something else? I believe to a large degree it is because the church has failed to present Jesus to them. Why would people leave the church and go and become Hindus in Hollywood? Why? It's because the church has failed. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, we'll find that in verse 32, that same chapter 12, I will draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up, are we lifting up Jesus? Are you lifting up Jesus at your work, at your school, in your home, in your family? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It didn't say lift up your church or denomination or lift up your organization, lift up your family name. He didn't say that. He didn't say lift up your religion or your traditions. He said, if I be lifted up, talk about me, he says. Witness about me. Preach about me. Amen. Teach about me. Let me live in your testimony. Let me live in your preaching. Let me live in your singing. Let me be the main attraction. Nothing else. Let me be the reason for your gathering together. Not for any other reason. Then, and only then, will I draw all men unto me. And your churches won't die. And your homes be, be, will be filled with peace. And they will come alive with the resurrection power. And your churches will be on fire again. We wish to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. Yes, we demand to see Jesus. Amen. We won't settle for anything less than a personal contact with Jesus. Amen. Don't just tell me about him. I don't want to hear about me, him. Take me to him. I want to meet him personally. If we can take people to Jesus, I believe we would have done our mission. Amen. People need to be connected to Jesus. If we can take the bound and the oppressed, the sick and the diseased to Him, we would have fulfilled our mission here. Folks, I am under this very great conviction that we have failed in our mission to get people to Jesus. We have good friends, we have family members, but we have failed to bring people to Jesus. We need to see this as our mission. Amen. We need to see this as our lifeblood. Yes. Nothing else must be more important. We must take people to Jesus. Amen. Paul the Apostle said, I determined to know Nothing among you.
same Jesus Christ and him be crucified. I'm not interested in the politics. I'm not interested in all your stories and all your problems. I want one thing. One thing. Jesus. Hey. Jesus alone. You see, Paul was a highly educated man. And he was deeply spiritual. But with all his wisdom and knowledge and spiritual experience, he determined to hold himself to the preaching of Jesus Christ. He determined that he would know nothing else. He didn't want to be an expert in anything else. He wanted to make Jesus his all in his life. And he goes on to say in Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. And so the gospel, the good news, is the power of God. This salvation is all inclusive. Now most times we think of salvation as just coming to Jesus. Now, that's not true. It is also healing for the body, deliverance for the bound, peace and prosperity and wholeness. I don't believe in a salvation that will only just bring you to the Lord and then you're still in your misery, pain and your suffering. What good is that? What good is it coming to Jesus if all you know is you changed God from one little God in the corner, now you've got no God in your house, and nothing else happens? What is that? There's got to be a change. There's got to be transformation. Something must happen in your life. If you have just changed gods, then you better go back and get your God back. Get your old gods back. There's got to be a change in your life. Amen. There's got to be prosperity in your life. Wholeness. Amen. There's got to be nothing else. Because Jesus is the sum total of everything I need. Amen. He is all I need. You got Jesus, you got everything. Amen. You got Jesus, you got health. Amen. You got Jesus, you got prosperity. Amen. You got Jesus, you got a future. What's the good having Jesus? You just change names of God. Krishna and now Jesus. And you're still in your poverty. You're still poor like a church mouse. No good. Go back. Go back to your old gods. It's no good if it's not making a difference in your life. We don't need the gospel just to be saved. We need the gospel to live by every day. Amen. The gospel of Christ is the life to be lived. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of Jesus. Amen. Not bad news. We meet some people all the time. It's only bad news. All the time they've got bad news. Problems, 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 sickness, pain, disease, something happened. Bad news. No place in the Bible do we find the life of Christ more fully revealed than in the four Gospels. You need to get back there and see life that it ought to be lived. We must present to the world and to the church the Jesus of the Bible. Not the Jesus that we, we hear about these days. The Jesus of the Gospels. The Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of mercy and compassion. Who casts out demons. Heals the sick. Cleanses the lepers. Raises the dead. Works miracles. Signs and wonders. That's the Jesus we need to know. We need to meet. We need to love. In many churches today, they are told that there are no more demons. Demons were only in the Bible days. They are told that miracles and signs and wonders were for the early church and not for today. 
They are no longer needed today and not for us. But the devil is a liar. Because my Bible tells me in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. He doesn't change. Then we don't believe these skeptics and agnostics and lunatics who tell us that these things should not happen. It must happen because our Jesus is the same. Acts 10 and verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing only a few. Healing all that were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. What purpose? That it might destroy the works of the devil. You know, when the works of the devil is destroyed, it means it's finished. He came to destroy. That was his mission. Jesus said in Mark 16, Verses 15 to 18, that the first time that would follow his true believers was that they shall cast out devils. Then they shall speak with new tongues. Now, don't let anybody tell you that tongues passed away or they're not for today. Jesus said this himself, that his believers would speak with new tongues. Tongues. Then he said, they, that's the believers, shall take up serpents. Now, I don't want you to go around looking for serpents. Because serpents here meaning demons of sickness, disease, oppression. You can take this up. Why? Because in the name of Jesus, you take it up to destroy it. You have the authority to take it up. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. And this Jesus of the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when the sinner sees him dying on the cross for his or her sins, and he or she accepts him, as their sin substitute, they are saved. When the sick and the afflicted see him at the whipping post, taking those stripes for the healing and deliverance, and they recognize that Jesus suffered in their place, and that he took their sicknesses and their diseases, and he carried their sorrows, and they accept that by faith, what happens? They are healed. Amen. When the believer sees Jesus raised from the dead, having put their sins away, coming to live within them through the power of the Holy Spirit, then they will enter into all the blessings and the benefits of the Christian life that was purchased for them through the atoning and substitutionary work of Jesus. Amen. And so when we see Jesus, we see everything. Amen. When we see Jesus, when we have Jesus, we have everything. I believe, folks, as I said, in church doctrine based on the Word of God. I believe in divine healing. I believe in prosperity. I believe in the church as the divine institution ordained by God. But my primary mission and your primary mission and commission is to be Jesus and to lift him up. Amen. Wherever Amen. you have this one mission, at work tomorrow, you must mission, your mission is to lift Jesus up. Amen. Wherever you are, at the supermarket, no matter how prices are going up, no matter you don't have money for this and money for that, lift Jesus up. Amen. And you'll see things change in your lives. Amen. 
the gospel means good news. But if we take Jesus out of our preaching, if we take Jesus out of our lives, there's no good news. There's bad news. Without Jesus in our singing, our preaching, our teaching, there's no gospel. The world is dying to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is there such a lack of power in many of our churches? Why is there that so many people are so sick? Many are oppressed. Many are depressed. Many are down. Many are